hello, we're back, and hopefully you can hear us well. So, the last session of the day, parallel. Uh, should we just get straight to it? So, I think so. To my screen here, parallel. Yeah, so Thor is the uh, leader here. So, why are we doing. Like, what's parallel and why do we care about it? Right. Well, we care about it because of performance, which is not always great for Python. Sometimes running things on one processor is not enough. Uh, it takes too long. But as we'll come to, I think there are a number of things you should do before you actually try to parallelize your code. Mm -hmm. But parallelization is increasingly important. I mean, you don't only have one single core on your laptop or your desktop computer. You have eight or, or maybe more. And then you have all these HPC high performance computing clusters mm -hmm. uh, around the world, which have tens or hundreds or millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of processors or even millions. Yeah. So how much do you expect or should one of the watchers of this course know? Well, say at the end of the course yeah. and well, I think we, everyone should, the take home message will be that there are these options for parallelizing Python. Mm -hmm. It's good to know about them. You might need to use it sooner or later. We will, of course, not have any time to delve into any, any details, but it's good to know what's there, what you can do, and you can come back and, and learn more uh, in the future if you might need it. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a good thing. So what yeah. do we need to know about the modes of parallelism? Yeah, so there are different modes, but I think there are, we should first focus on these five steps, which one should consider uh, when something is taking too long. Mm -hmm. So have you, have you noticed sometimes, uh, Richard, that, you know, you're running something and it just takes too long. Like you don't have, you don't have a bit, the bit data set is too big or, you yeah. know, it's just the computer keeps churning and, and you yeah. don't get the result. Yeah, back when I did more stuff with data. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And so the first step is what? <clears throat> well, measure. <clears throat> so it's a very common mistake uh, to start parallelizing, to start optimizing before you actually measure. And there is this famous quote by a famous computer scientist. Um, how is it now? Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Right. Yeah, that's it. It's a bit drastic, but uh, yeah. yeah. So the point of that is that you should first measure, and there are these profiling tools in Python and in any other programming language where you get information on where time is being spent. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. would use that to actually see where the slow spots are. Maybe there's a function that gets called a million times, and that's where 90% of the time, uh, total execution time is spent. Yeah, and that basically matches what I've seen. So. When my code slow, it's usually not something radical like doing parallelization or something. It's realizing there's something that was just written quickly and doesn't make sense. And with some low effort changes, I can make it work well enough. Yes, exactly. So parallelization brings in another layer of complexity. So if you get a adequate speed up just from looking at that that bottleneck and improving it. I mean, it can be about changing the algorithm. Maybe you don't need to use a, a, a for loop. You can maybe use broadcasting in NumPy. Mm -hmm. I mean, bring in these really fast libraries like NumPy and Pandas and so on. Yeah. And if that's still not enough, there are these packages for pre-compiling. Uh, like you, you, you add some extra decorators and some extra code to actually make your Python functions get compiled ahead of time or just in time. Mm -hmm. So Numba and Cython are two very well-known packages. So we, we're not looking into that here, but there are links at the bottom of this uh, this this page with link, with the tutorials on Cython and, and Numba. Yeah. Okay. And after that, you can start parallelizing, right? Or think yeah. about, thinking about it. So what are the main categories of parallelization we should think about? Yeah, I guess that's um, 
uh, up to, I mean, there are sort of different definitions, but one clear distinction you can make is first, the first category would be embarrassingly parallel. It sounds a bit negative, but what it re refers to is simply if you're, you have to run some code a thousand times with a thousand different parameters. Mm -hmm. That's an embarrassingly parallel pro problem because yeah. you don't need any communication between those thousand runs. Mm -hmm. They can all run at the same time. And that's usually pretty easy to do. But yeah, and there are the sort of of tools to do that. Like one of the tools that are, are shown below, uh, Dask will probably not cover it here, but you can look at it later. You can do embarrassingly parallel things there, but there are also uh, like workflow managers and so on that enable you to automatize these tasks over, uh, and run them maybe uh, all at once on a cluster or something. Yeah. And then beyond that, what comes next? Yeah, then there's the, I guess, somewhat more complicated approaches, multi-threading on one hand, and on the other hand, multi-processing slash message passing slash distributed computing. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that multi-threading is when you have many threads, which will uh, be running on different uh, cores, uh, CPU cores, they share memory. So you, you can have sort of like a, a loop or something where the different iterations of the loop are handled by a separate thread, mm -hmm. but they're operating on the same, on data in the same memory. Mm -hmm. While the, la the last category there, multiprocessing or, or message passing, you can do that on a single computer with so-called shared memory too, but you can also run it on different computers. Mm -hmm. Um, on uh, on a cluster or on different servers, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So there's and a we'll look into. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. There's a question in HackMD: Is my code automatically going to use all CPUs on my machine? Oh, Which excellent question. I and think... this uh, actually leads us to something we wanted to show you. Yeah. So but first, should we talk about this big uh, elephant in the room when it comes to Python and parallel? Yeah. So the global interpreter lock, what is yeah. it? What is it? So it's a design choice that developers of Python made a long time ago um, that only one single thread in a Python process can actually compute, can actually run Python code. And this sounds like it makes it just parallelism completely impossible. And this under the hood, technically, this is called the global interpreter lock. Yeah. So we have a little demo here of it. So I guess the main point is that things like NumPy aren't bound to this because they're running stuff in C code. Exactly. So that's, that's another reason you want to use these languages. So I have a quick demo. I would say I'll do this too fast. So don't necessarily try to do it yourself, hmm. but let's see. So here's my Jupyter. I'm making a new file going to make a new Python file and I will copy and paste this into it. So this is something that uses NumPy. And remember that NumPy is written in C mostly. Yes. So I'm saving it. Now I'm going to make a new terminal. Actually, I have my old terminal here, Python numpy test. Should we do it like this first? Yeah, sure. Okay. And I'll use this time built in. You don't need to. The, the code actually oh, spits out the time. It doesn't. Okay. Then good. Oh, do I need to save it? That probably helps. Hopefully. Okay, so it took five seconds. Five seconds. And while um, you're explaining that, I'll do the next part. Uh, yeah. So there is, uh, so there are some environment variables that uh, control how many threads are, are are being used, and this particular thing that Richard just wrote, omp num threads. This has to do with OpenMP. Okay, it doesn't make much of a difference on your machine. 
I mean, maybe because most of my processors are being used for streaming right now. That's probably it. So when I run this on my computer, a laptop, a Mac, uh, it's four times slower. And that's because when you just run NumPy code without doing anything, it's automatically parallelizing it. It's using threads under the hood, so-called OpenMP <coughs> threads. Yeah. But I guess this is the main point here is this is a demonstration that NumPy actually is using multiple processors. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's yeah. the take home message here. So there, a lot of things come for free, okay. but we'll also show you how you move beyond this and, and actually parallelize things yourself. Yeah. And next up is multiprocessing. Yeah, I think this is a go-to library for many Python developers yeah. if they need to parallelize. So which paradigm would you say it uses? Of the three? Yeah, so this is the message passing, the multiprocessing paradigm. Okay. You can run multiprocessing on different servers, on different nodes of a supercomputer. Mm -hmm. You can also run it just on a, one machine. Yeah. And it's also you can also classify it in a different way. So it uses this map reduce paradigm That's... where you map a problem over multiple processes, and then you reduce the results from the different processes into one. Yeah, which looks like here. So we have a function that does some computing. It squares a number. Yeah. And we have here a list of input values and the function and map. So here we've squared each of these numbers. Hmm. But here we've to done it. out that maybe you could do this, of course, with a for loop or mm -hmm. I in one, two, three, four, five, six, do this, but this is just a different way. You can use right. this map function. Yeah. And once you have the map function, then you can do cool stuff. Like if we look down below here, we've got a multiprocessing pool oh. and the pool, instead of using a built-in map function to Python, oh. we do multiprocessing pool.map and it will detect how many processors I have use all of them and run all of these at the same time. Yeah, or if you only have four processors, you know, four will be computing one thing at the time and then the next batch will be shipped, you know, so it's, yeah. there's some automatic distribution of work uh, to those uh, pools yeah. of workers. So if you can structure your code where you have some code and variable input data, then this can do things very easily. Hmm. Do we go straight to the exercise then? Yeah, but there's this big caveat there mm -hmm. in the warning box. You have to scroll up a little. Uh, yes. So this might not work for you. It does not work for me. And according to the documentation of multiprocessing, this should not work. But uh, we found out that it worked for you, Richard. Yeah, which is uh, so. So that what strange. doesn't work or is perhaps not supposed to work is to run multiprocessing in an interactive environment. So Jupyter or the Python command, uh, you know, the REPL mm -hmm. or IPython yeah. or techni technical reasons. So what is supposed to be to work uh, always is that you put your code into a file, into a script and you run the script. Mm -hmm. So that's the non-interactive way, but uh, clearly in some cases it could work uh, interactively too. Yeah. But there is a workaround. So there is this other package called multiprocess, not multiprocessing, but multiprocess, that one. And it's a fork, it's almost the same code, it's just modified a little bit, and you can install it with this pip install command. Mm -hmm. And then instead of importing, you know, in the import statement there from, from multiprocessing, you do from multiprocess. That, that's the big caveat. So yeah. you can try both. If you're working in Jupyter, you can try first uh, multiprocessing. It might crash yeah, or like it might not work. It might give you a, an error. Mm -hmm. Which, and it's pretty cool how you've written it one way and by simply changing some imports, you can change the way it's running. And that yeah. Yeah. is, but okay. So how long should we give for the exercise? I think 15 minutes, uh, okay. but let's, shall we describe the exercise a little bit? Yeah, okay. So just for one minute, just yeah. to get everyone on the same page. So what do we do in here? So it's, it's, it's a toy example. We're computing pi. We have this function sample, which takes in a number 
and it checks if that number, uh, a random number between zero and one, whether it's inside, no, it, yeah, so it takes in a number of iterations and then it computes random numbers, X and Y, and checks if the uh, sum some of their squares are below one, yeah. the unit circle, and then it increments a number. So it's yeah. it's sort of a way to compute pi. It's, yeah, it's like putting random or putting random points on a square, how many of them are inside a circle on the square. And from mm. that, you can compute the pi. Yeah, and the idea here is okay. that you can call it with a million. N is equal to a million, and you can run it on one processor. It might take some seconds. But then your task will be to use multiprocessing and this pool construct, the the work, yeah, and split up the work between different uh, processors. Yeah. Right. So sample takes an argument how many times to do it, and we use multiprocessing to call sample, say, 10 times with 100,000 each. Mm. or something like that mm. okay yeah um and there's a solution as a hint if you'd like mm. okay well i guess we will send you to it then yeah and keep the questions coming in hackmd yes okay talk to you soon bye hello we're back. All right. So, it seems that some of you had <clears throat> some issues. Yes. Uh, um, but I think they will be addressed in HackMD in the, in the document. Yeah. So uh, it's understandable that it doesn't work for everyone. I mean, things can, can go wrong. Yeah. Uh, I hope it will be useful at least to have a look at the solutions so yeah. you can see how it's supposed to be done. Yeah. And this is like once you get to the parallel stuff, debugging it can be mm. quite tricky. I mean, yeah. this is we're not dealing with the parallel code itself, but yeah, don't get discouraged and keep working at it mm. and see our examples. And if the examples don't work, let us know and we'll fix them. Yeah. But for the next uh, half or 15 minutes, we have two other topics to go to. Uh, let's see, I'll switch back to my screen. So there's MPI, mm. and I believe this is a demo. Yes, it's mostly a demo. If anyone really wants to type along, you can do that, but yeah. we cannot guarantee that everything will work because MPI we asked you to install MPI for Pi. It was part of the software installation instructions for the environment. But that's like the most error prone package among the packages that we asked you to install. Yeah. So there could be an issue, but let's see, you can try. Yeah. So MPI, the, in, the lesson says it's message passage, passing interface. So yeah. what does that mean exactly? Yeah, what is it? So it's it's an old package, right? Uh, like it's an old library. It's an old um, standard. Mm -hmm. I mean, been around for 40 years maybe, or maybe more, I'm not sure. Um, and it's still a standard workhorse of HPC. It's used, it's installed and available on every single supercomputer on the planet. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different model from what you're used to. I mean, if you have written many serial programs, you just thought about, yeah, running things on one core. You really have to take a different perspective. You have to think differently when you use MPI. That's the bad news. The good news, it's it's really powerful. You can do a lot of stuff and you can parallelize a lot of different uh, problems. Yeah. And maybe let's just walk through those uh, items uh, quickly. So you you talk about tasks or ranks so that's the parallel processes that are being run at the same time mm -hmm. and they each have an index they have a number zero one two three and so on and they manage their own memory so this is a distributed memory uh, paradigm they communicate explicitly so when you use multiprocessing you use this parallel map the pmap function to automatically sort of send out work to to some workers who will then uh, communicate back uh, their computed result 
and a lot of stuff happens automatically there. With MPI, you really have to do it manually. You send messages manually. Um, and what the, the main sort of gotcha, the main thing that you have to keep in mind is that all the tasks, also known as ranks, they run the entire program. So it's not like you saw with multiprocessing, there was only one line of code where you actually submitted jobs to the remote uh, workers. In MPA, it's the case instead is that, you know, every rank runs through the entire code and yeah, at the same time independently. And I think we have to look at an example to make this more concrete. Yeah. Should we, should I scroll down? And yeah, here we see the example. the example. Yeah. Okay. So this is an MPI yeah. example. So first is from MPI for Pi import MPI, which I guess handles everything. Somehow. It imports everything you need. And uh, and the code is familiar, right? It's the same yeah. code you did for the multiprocessing. So yeah, okay. So sample takes a number of arguments or number of iterations and returns two values. Okay. Yeah. So here's... And then the rows that are marked in yellow are the MPI specific ones. The three first ones, the com size rank, they are absolutely standard. You do it every time. Every single MPI code has this. First, you have to, uh, well, you, you, the com uh, thing is the communicator. It's like the world in which your ranks live. So every, every rank, every process that's inside a communicator can talk to each other. And then size and rank, you always call this get size and the get rank methods to first, the size is the number of ranks you have. Okay. And the rank is the rank of the process that is currently running this line. Mm, so, so as I told you, you, if you run this with four ranks, all the ranks are, uh, are um, running the same code and they will all get a unique value of this rank okay. variable. So basically process zero can say, okay, I'm the leader or yeah, something like that. Yeah. So usually you have one master rank, master process that you yeah. will see uh, how, how okay. that works. And scrolling on down, we see N tells us we do 10 million iterations. So if yeah. size is greater than one, so I guess that says if we're actually parallel at all. Yeah. Then divide so you will up often, the work. Yeah. You'll often see conditional statements like this in MPI. So if my rank is zero, do this. If my rank is something else, do something else. And in this case, like if the size, if we're running on more than one uh, course, then split up this number N into uh, the size. Uh, I mean, you split. Uh, so the, yeah, you, oh. you divide by the, the number of parallel processes. Yeah. Otherwise, you just end task becomes the value itself. Yeah. Then. Okay. And then we have this is about timing here. Well, timing, and then it actually runs it with the number of tasks we need. Yeah. Yeah. So and, this... and there, that, that, this is important to keep in mind. So each rank will run this line independently of each other, mm -hmm. and they will get their own value of this and inside circle variable. Mm, so every okay. rank will go into this function, the sample function, mm. and you know, generate the random numbers, everything yeah. that's inside that function, and return a unique value of this yeah. and inside circle. Okay, yeah. Four separate processes, four different values of inside circle, and then they're collected or gathered in MPI terminology here. Yes. So this is one out of many methods that uh, are common in MPI. This is the gather one. Maybe the most fundamental ones are the send and receive methods. That's to explicitly like send a message between one rank and another rank. But this get and that's called point to point communication. Like two ranks explicitly are communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. But this gather function here is it's called a global, it's um, belongs to the global communication mm -hmm. methods. And in this case, what happens, what do you think happens, Richard? Well, 
and inside circle and root zero, does this mean that if you're zero then, or zero gets the values of everything else? Yeah. And does it add them together automatically? I don't see a sum here. No, it's not a reduction. There is another collective communication method called reduce, oh. but this is just to gather the data. Okay, so this becomes a list. It becomes a list, exactly. And inside circle, okay. Okay, yeah, so down here we see, so if it's rank equals zero, then we yeah. do sum of that list. Yeah. And the final calculation formula. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And let's just demo this, right? Yeah. Shall we do that? Okay, so I'll be typing somewhat fast here. So maybe just watch. I copy all the code. I'll come back to Jupyter and make a new Python file. I will paste it all. I will rename it to FBI test. I will remember to save it this time. I will go back to the terminal. Hmm. And then to actually run it, what do I do? Um, yeah, MPI. you don't run it the normal way. You can run, run it the normal way, Python. Actually try doing that just for good measure. This works. Yeah, okay, it's not good. crashing, so. Not crashing, but it, which it's guess, running up, yeah. Yeah, which I guess is good because then you don't have to use the MPI. No, exactly. Yeah, okay. So if but I the want MPI to run way, it... Yeah, the MPI way of running things is not to just run it like this, but to append at the beginning of the command, mm -hmm. MPI exec, so MPI execute, and then you specify the number of ranks the number of processes. So, so let's try and four. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then Python. So you're running Python mm -hmm. in parallel. Well, one point one second. So that was actually uh, four times faster. Yeah, four times faster. Unlike the multiprocessing example I did, or yeah. no, unlike the yeah. NumPy example. Let's try eight. But let's have a look at the output. Yeah, you can run this too. Okay, yeah. And that was a bit faster. Okay, faster. yeah, so the output. So there's a print there before gather, after gather. Yeah, so it shows all the ranks, and there's something, and inside circle becomes none. But for rank zero, then it got this list of everything. Yeah, so after the gather, the rank zero has all the results from all the other ranks. Yeah. And then computes the average and uh, prints yeah. it. Well, that wasn't too hard. No. Well, it's the, the, these collective uh, communication methods are sort of high level. They, it's, it's many algorithms can sort of be mapped into that particular Type uh, into you know using communi uh, global um, collective communication, mm -hmm. but there's a lot. I mean, this is a whole science. I mean, there are week long workshops on MPI. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to be learned there. So yeah, but if if it's interesting to you, uh, if it you think this could help you in your project, whoever is is watching this, then uh, look closer into the. There are some links inside this lesson. Uh, to further reading. Yeah. Okay, so what comes next? We've got a few minutes left. So minutes, yeah. coupling to other languages, we mentioned in the library ecosystem some. So the basic yeah. idea is if you already have some code in another language, you can usually pretty easily use it from Python. And this is probably one of the big reasons why Python became so uh, common in mm. science. It was good for doing general work and good for connecting to things. So you could glue stuff together really well. Um, should we talk about task and task use? Let's just mention it briefly. Again, this is another huge topic. You can do so many things with task. Maybe some of you have heard about it before. Uh, what can you do? You can do this embarrassingly parallel stuff. If you like, if you import task and you use task, you can sort of specify that um, 
all these independent steps, you identify some independent steps, should be run on different uh, processes. But another very cool thing about Dask is, are these distributed data structures. Mm. So there is like an analogy to NumPy array mm -hmm. called a Dask array. Okay, I see. There's it. an analogy. Yeah. Dask you array. See you see it down there. Yeah. Yeah. And also the same thing with a data frame. So there are these uh, distributed data frames. So and what does yeah, if, go ahead. If I have a data frame that say a hundred million rows, I could yeah. use Dask for that, yeah. and it sort of automatically parallelizes it for me. Yeah, you can split your data frame over any number of uh, computers, any number of ranks, uh, not ranks, uh, tasks. Okay, nice. So I and guess... that's what you specified down there, right? So the with the array example. Mm -hmm chunks you're telling you're creating a two by two random matrix okay two by and two. then you're saying that you want to chunk up the matrix so it's a ten thousand by ten thousand matrix mm -hmm. you create thousand by thousand chunks mm -hmm. and dask will actually put those chunks on separate uh, cpus separate processors okay And then you have all the other common NumPy stuff like transpose minus mean or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is that the end? Um, task mm. use. Is there anything to say there or? This has to do uh, with these uh, this embarrassingly parallel uh, use case of yeah. Dask. But I mean, it's such a big topic that people will just have to look at these links. There are uh, links down there to other tutorials. Yeah. Okay. So that's the day. Um, what was the summary of parallel? Mm. Mm. Oh, sorry. What is the summary? The, su the summary of the parallel lesson. I guess right. three modes, profile first, uh, use existing libraries. And if you need more, it's available even in Python. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But ask any questions in HackMD. Is yeah. there any high level general questions or let's see. Or the technical oh. nitty gritty questions. Oh, we need feedback of the day. Oh yeah. Uh, I think today worked pretty well. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I think I hope everyone found it to be interesting and not too fast, not too slow. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Thank you a lot for these positive comments. Very nice to see. I have a feeling one of the keys to a good workshop is don't let me teach too much unless <laughs> I'm actually focusing on it. The more we have other people teaching, the better it is. I think your teaching has been awesome today. But today, but that today, the day I haven't been teaching yesterday, not so much. Um, right. I, I dumped the Panda stuff on you. <laughs> I mean, I just was too busy. Yeah. No, but teaching in this collaborative way, I can just tell everyone listening that it's so much fun yeah. and it's, it's efficient. Of course, it takes more manpower, but um, less effort for uh, every individual person. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to join us, so the, a good way is the code refinery chat. Mm -hmm. uh, there's anyway, lots of interesting discussion there about scientific computing and technical topics yeah. if you would like to teach with us well hang out there and let us know you're interested in being a co-instructor yeah. um if you're in an organization that's not offering this suggest them to um point point us to them or point them to us and say look like if you 
advertise this to us, you can run your own breakout room, you can have a co-instructor. This is an international partnership among, is it only two countries this time? No, three, because Sapre is here from Norway tomorrow. Mm. And we can take in other countries. I mean, there's no limit on how many people can watch Twitch. So, you know, the more people, the better. And we can even offer more of these other courses. Yeah. Maybe we should ask at the end of tomorrow for what, ask people what they would like to learn next. I mean, yeah. is there any mm. new lesson that people would want to see that's not already out there, that is not being taught? Yeah. We're in a few weeks, we're planning a course in February called a workflows course, where we'll go into more details about specific ways people put all of these tools together. Like how one person actually takes parallel stuff and array jobs and so on and puts it on a cluster. Mm. Yeah. So if you're interested, that might be a thing to contribute to. There's several more follow-up courses we've been mentioning, but the Code Refinery course is really important because it teaches sort of the software development side of stuff, like the version control, yeah. the automated testing, and so on. Yeah. Um, well, I have to use the opportunity actually to um, advertise the ENCCS workshop on mm -hmm. Python. So it go it takes the next step after this one. This so is, with a focus on high performance computing and high performance data analytics. When is it offered? Uh, initially, we were hoping to give it already in February, but February is a bit packed, so it will be moved to April. Should we do uh, a live stream? I think we should opt for that. Yeah. Let's, okay. Well, that would be nice to do. Let's do Let's it. Let's try. So keep. Uh, maybe I can even uh, throw out some dates here. Yeah. Uh... Uh... We have tentative dates set. Anyway, the, the lesson follows the same format as uh, what we're looking at now for this Python for scientific computing. We are thinking, no, actually May, 18th, 19th May. Hmm. But uh, yeah, block, block your block your calendars, 18th, 19th May, Python for HPC, high performance data analytics. Uh, is, there's a lot more on Dask there. There is um, more on MPI. There is Numba, Cython, profiling, GPU computing. Yeah. Hmm. So tomorrow, what do we have? There is, so we aren't continuing parallel tomorrow because we finished it today. So yeah, I agree with the comment. There's so much more to do, but well, it's basically multiple week long courses. So tomorrow we're not so much about the Python programming itself, but once you have the program, how do you use it? So one is the dependencies. So how you keep all of these other things you're using organized. And then we talk about binder, which is a quick introduction to how you can allow this service called MyBinder for other people to run your code easily in the cloud. And then packaging, which is basically taking your code and making it where it's installable which even for you, I've been happier once I've made stuff installable. And then there's a panel discussion. So we basically take all the instructors and anyone else who'd like to participate, and we come around and we'll answer any questions you may have. And you can see how much we agree or disagree and stuff like that. Then there's a quick outro, and then I'll paste a Zoom link into the Twitch chat in HackMD. And anyone can join us and sort of talk about what we're doing together. Like, you know, you we can talk interactively that way if you'd like. Sort of an after party. So be prepared for that and come with questions. The question, will we do a similar course on R? Um, I guess we don't have enough R experts to do this, but 
I'm sure. But I can uh, flag that there is a workshop being planned uh, as a collab col collaboration between several Swedish HPC centers mm -hmm. to teach uh, over three days Python in HPC, R in HPC, Julia in HPC. It's it's HPC focused, but um, yeah, so it doesn't really perhaps exactly match what this person was hoping for, but I just thought yeah. I'd flag that. Yeah. I mean, if you look around, there's countless courses on all these topics around. So as far as I know, we're the only massively open live stream course using our kind of strategies, but we hope there'll be more later. Yeah, so should we get going? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll leave the feedback open for a bit more and see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Thanks for today. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.